The following documents and recordings are the third instalment in a compilation detailing the events of Grey and Kazan's return to Svalbard, following the occurrences of Outpost Freestead and Base Camp Piedra. Mr. Kasner was accompanied by fellow specialist Drakana Vukovic, archaeology professor Dr. Josefa Guerrero, and oceanographer Dr. Amelia Murray. In the summer months, Arctic cyclones are the foremost type of hazardous weather present in areas across the northern Atlantic, northern Pacific, and North Seas. Capable of developing tumultuous sea conditions, impacting sea ice, dropping heavy precipitation, and resulting in avalanches, these Arctic cyclones can severely impact the lives of local populations. During these storms, travel is not advised. The White Vault During the previous compilation, the team had reached the weather station in Nyarlasan hoping it would be the remaining secure location for survivors. When they reached the hatch atop the station, Dr. Amelia Murray was the first to descend. The following recording begins where the last recording was cut. The recording from Mr. Kasner's body camera became muffled soon after, as he jumped down into the building and knocked his camera slightly ajar. It was later fixed, but for clarity, the following comes from the body camera of Dr. Guerrero. Get down. Don't What's shoot. happening? Drop the gun. Did you find survivors? Yes, okay. You two. We thought you were one of them. We are not them. Dragana, get down here. Go first. I'll watch your back, then come down. Thank you. <laughs> one of you was a medical doctor? No. An archaeologist and an oceanographer. I think you broke my hand. I'm sorry, again. We do have a nurse who has been helping with any wounds. We're in the Stay next... Stay where you are. Dragana! <laughs> broken, as I said. Again, I apologize, but there's something out there. I thought you were it. I know your voice. You were the one on the recording. From the Canadian Arctic Zone Science Organization. Yes, I'm Dr. Carter Dwan. I was manning the local station before all of this. The person working the Longyearbyen station, what's their name? Kelly. Red hair. Hideous sweaters. Good. Let's get Dr. Murray to the nurse. Which way? Uh, this way. You know Kelly? Yes. When did you join Kazo? The end of 2008. November or December. How many survivors do you have? We're five total. Here. Hey, the sound we heard was more survivors. Is anyone hurt? Me. Come here. Let's have a look. This is all that's left? When the storm came up on the radar, people stopped coming in from Long Yerbyen. A few boats left the harbor beforehand, but that was over a week ago. There were a couple of teams, mostly tourists, and one survey group that left by snowmobile before the fog became too thick. But we haven't had any contact with them since. And the remaining survivors? The ones we encountered inside the other building. What about them? We know they're there, but there's something wrong with them. They just chant and won't listen to reason. Is that who you thought we were? No. Sometimes people appear. People we know. People we know didn't make it. If we were one of those things, you'd be dead by now. And we don't know each other. Exactly. So between not mimicking a dead acquaintance and forming a variety of full sentences, I think we're safe for now. Now, who are you? Which group were you with? Sorry. I have to set the hand to wrap it. 
you showed a lot of restraint by not just shooting her when she dropped in. We thought the room was clear. I never had to use the guns at all before this week. It worked out this time, but don't take chances. But who are you? Where were you hiding this whole time? We work for a private tourism group. Thankfully, we're not with the tourists right now. I'm Dragana. This is Kasner and Dr. Carrero. The hatch was not locked. Have you locked the other doors? Yes, of course. We aren't from the weather station crew. Well, I'm not. But he is. The unconscious man? Yes. He's not injured. He just drinks everything he can find. How does that feel now? Terrible. I think your second metacarpal is broken. Now, the temporary brace is on, so try not to move your fingers. Here. Pain meds. This is going to swell up. Thank you. I'm Dr. Amelia Murray. Nadine Tooling. Dr. Murray is staying here with you, but we need to leave. Wait, what happened here? You don't know? I already told you there are dead people. But if I tell you there are monsters, will you think I'm crazy? No, not at all. The weather wasn't the first sign, though it helped keep casualties down. At least in the beginning. Not so much now that we can't get out of here. But one day, a week ago, there was a terrible noise that we all thought was some dying animal. And that evening, I heard something breaking, metal scraping and bending. I called it in to Kelly and went to check what was happening. It all spun out of control very quickly after that. Some communication equipment had been torn down. The first of the buildings were already torn open. And that was the day Dr. Katri disappeared. That night, we heard snowmobiles. A group tried to make a break for Long Yerbyen over land. But that time, we didn't see who. No one ever made it. Not as far as we know. In this weather, I don't have hope they made it far. Not with what's out there. What is out there? I haven't seen it. Not directly. I saw something through the fog once, when I was running here. I'm not sure I could describe it, but like we said, sometimes people show up, dead people, and there's something in the water. Stone statues in the waves. Maybe they look like that. I don't know. After they showed up, no one could leave by boat, even before the weather turned. The boats that got out a week ago were lucky. They were here before the fog? Yes. What was next? Over the next few days, some people started chanting. Others panicked. Everyone was trying to hide. Nadine, Paul, Lori, and I met in the medical building while looking for supplies. I had found Lisa, and they said they'd help me get her to safety in the weather station. We've been here for a few days now. Is this woman Lisa? Yes. She's been in shock for several days now. And where is Lori? Working the radio in the room next door. We take turns reaching out to Longyearbyen for assistance. How do you know the creature is still out there? It is safer to assume it is. Even if it's gone, this is the only remaining building in New Orleans that's safe to wait out the weather. We have resources, and at least for now, our own power. Lisa's not like the others. She's not chanting. She's traumatized. We found her in one of the smaller tourism huts. She was a tour organizer for a group out of Shanghai. Carter found her stuck under the bodies of her tour group. Whatever it is out there that tore the roof off the little buildings and killed the others, she was lucky. Was she? The bar for lucky must be set pretty low. She has a chance of recovering. The others, though, the ones saying that poem over and over, I don't know. What language are you speaking? Mandarin. I have these pages, copies of notes from a fellow of mine, Dr. Liu. She was studying the creatures out there, and the stagers in the water, 
just like I am. She took notes, but I can't read them. She may have had the answer to what's going on, or at the least, she may have known more. Can you read them? I can, but what happened to Dr. Liu? She's dead. I thought you had to leave. If you can translate this, we'll wait. And a cup of coffee. Can I make coffee? Of course. Everything is right over there. Try not to wake up Paul. He's not taking all of this very well. It's better for everyone when he's out cold. Let me see the pages. Wow. This will take a little time. We'll wait. While not all of Carter Dewan's translation documents were recovered, the first several pages were collected by Dr. Guerrero. Given the state of Dr. Liu's notes, the remaining unknown qualities of the sigils and glyphs she originally documented or translated, and the eventual translation by Dr. Duan, there is significant room for an accuracy and deviation from the original intent. Dr. Liu herself took many possible liberties by incorporating more than pure translations into her explanation of the depicted events. It was during the time taken to translate this section that I believe Dr. Guerrero wrote her previous entries regarding the state of Nialasan and her findings. The following is the first section of Dr. Duan's translations from Dr. Liu's notebook regarding the glyphs and sigils at the site in both Patagonia and China. There's far too much for me to write in the limited time I have. I did not sleep last night. I tried not to, at least. I kept myself awake with coffee and fear. I know I can find more of the truth. There is so much more. I am losing my sense of time and distant memories. What was the name of my childhood cat? I can't remember now. When was the last time I ate? It is a trade. In return, I can see more in the glyphs every day. There is something more. More than stone relief and shadow and more than the long-gone hands of those that carved them. They set it to stone to tell others, and now I can know. Something terrible shook the earth, long before a language. Somehow, they told each other, they found a way, because it was too important not to. The earth shook and catastrophe gripped every cowering life. In fear and curiosity, Individuals ventured forth and found new tunnels in the rock, and glowing light from within. The light started to fade, and many of the people were drawn to the tunnel and to its light. They entered, though they returned changed. When those who returned from the light sought out their groups, sought their friends and family, they found them fearful, but they stayed, and the light faded with the fears. Years passed, and when the lights began to glow again, those who had changed told them to bring forth food, fruits and flowers, wild meats and fresh grains. The first year of the lights, this sufficed, and the lights receded. As time passed and children grew, the lights returned, and with them came the great unmoving creatures of stone. At night, the shadows moved and the stone creatures disappeared. One by one, screams were heard in the dark, and every morning, fewer and fewer remained. But those who had returned from the light, and the children of those who had returned from the light, never disappeared. The shadows followed them, but never harmed them. But the light faded, and the death sufficed. The people turned on the others, Men from the light fought to protect who they could, and many died. They all hid, and when the light returned and the statues returned, many of the children were fully grown. 
As others around them died and cursed them, they walked back into the lake. So numerous, they flooded the caverns in the rock, and found new homes in the lands beyond the white. These were the pages Dr. Guerrero had collected. The following recording comes from the body camera of Mr. Kasner, after he and the others had had time to read the translations. This... Uh, we can't stay. Graham, the weather is getting worse. We'll leave soon. It's outlandish. How is this supposed to help us? There's no light, but there may be statues. People are dying. Calm down, Carter. It's fascinating. Think of it. Who are those people who walked into the light? Perhaps like Lucas? No. No. Does it go on like that? Is there anything out of the ordinary? It's all out of the ordinary. The ordinary seems strange. There are sections that look like a list of objects and documents. Here, there are notes on getting to the airport, departure times, gate number. From the trip to Argentina, no doubt. Anything on the statues, their weaknesses, or what's through the doors and in the light? You either have time for me to go over everything here, or you don't. Dr. Liu never expressly says statues here. Not in the translated sections from the glyphs. But it says unmoving creatures of stone several times. I need to know more. We can't. This is taking too long. And the weather is worsening. The wind is picking up. We couldn't take off now, even if that was the goal. Graham, you have a goal. What about what happened to Rosa? The light? I don't know. There's not even a Rosa mentioned in anything I've read so far. Graham, I know you wanted the answers for her, but we can't expect them to show up. I want it. I wanted more than answers. I wanted Rosa to come out of that light. You saw the video from Jonas. She disappeared. There was a... There was a chance. Until you found her in those caves, now you know. She's gone. She was special to you and to others, I'm sure. But she wasn't special in whatever way these light people were, or are. She didn't survive, Graham. I still see her, Dragana, not it. Her. I'm sorry, my friend. When this is all over, you'll have time to grieve. But we need to go. People here are dying and we know how to stop it. Well, we think we do. Are there any snowmobiles remaining in town? There may be, in the maintenance building down the street. It's a repair station, but there could be some in working condition, or that already underwent repairs. All the others from the tourist or emergency response garages have been emptied. Can you do more, Dr. Duan? There is more. We don't have time, Josefa. Graham, if we found a few snowmobiles, could you fix them? Depends on what state they're in. Okay, I must be missing something. We found the survivors, and we know what's happening here, to some extent. Where are you going? It's certainly not safe to go out in these conditions and with those creatures out there. Mm. We have to check on another research station outside of town. We plan to come back here afterwards. But what they say is correct. You have to uh, look out for people you once knew. They'll use them like a lure. And it's not just the dead. We've seen it. People we know are dead. Coming back. If you came to town to check on a research station after the storm, how did you get here? We flew a helicopter and landed it not far from here. If you can keep everyone safe until we get back, I'll fly us out of here, weather permitting. Woman can go. A helicopter? We can go. We have to. We we could go now. No, no, we can't. Not only do we still need to get out to the research station, but I can't take off in this weather, regardless. For now, 
The safest thing is for you all to stay here. You have supplies, shelter from the elements, and that thing, a radio, and the possibility of getting out of this alive. If the weather lets up, you could survive. If? It, it has to clear up eventually. That would be the rational expectation. Oh, here. What is this? Hold it the other way around. Yep, yeah, like that. It's a body camera. Wear it, use it. There are some people trying to figure all this shit out, so this will help. If you really think you're going to die, take it off. I don't want to see you die. But it also does us no good if we lose this. <laughs> so, if I see anything you want to know... Me and others. And you think I might die? There's a chance all of us may die. <laughs> of course. I hope you understand how demented this is. You can't just leave us in a town with a wandering monster. What about you? Once you start up a snowmobile, you'll draw it right to you. We are walking into its net. It doesn't need to cast any father for us. What? What is that? The sat phone. Give me a moment. How? Nothing has been able to get... At this point in the recorded timeline, it is useful to return to the parallel events unfolding in Stockholm. After my mother and I had discussed several personal affairs, she had made it perfectly clear that she had kept a careful watch over my life over the years. We returned to the topic of family, and, more importantly, my assumed role in the company and its actions now that my half-sister had died. The following is a further section of the recording from my phone. Is that what you wanted to know? I'm sorry to hear that he did not find love again, but he raised you well. You've become a strong, direct, good-hearted woman. <sighs> and this is upsetting? It makes it all the more difficult. So tell me, and we can do the right thing. We can stop this all, and we can fix this. We can be on the same side. My dear, as I have said, there are no sides here. There is no right and wrong. There is only death or life. For all, or for few. No good and evil, just good. The greater or the lesser. So you're the lesser evil? The greater good? They are more similar than most want to admit. This is more of the cryptic shit I don't want to hear. What are you expecting? A history lesson? No. Given our conversation so far, I'm not expecting one. But that's exactly what I want. I won't have all the answers you are looking for. But you'll have some of them? My mother would know more. I would like you to meet her someday. Do you plan on bringing her to this cafe? Because I'm not following you to a secondary location. The simple choice to not end up murdered by a Swedish psychopath, even it is my mother. I would never hurt you, dear. Ever. Above everything else, you have to understand this. I love you. This family is my priority. Your family. I will do everything to protect my children. I know I have already failed, but I will not make the same mistake again. I cannot. And I can only continue to try and express both my love and my sorrow for having to place such a weight on your shoulders. What weight, exactly? What is on my shoulders? <sighs> if I say everything, will you believe I am being overdramatic? Dramatic and worse, evasive. I am not being evasive. I'm just... scared. The last time I told my daughter, it was too difficult to convince her of the severity of it all. I did it wrong. And I know now that there is a reason for the way we have all been told. To stumble upon the truth ourselves. The last thing I want is for you to leave, and not just because I will not get to see you again. I fear everything that could happen. But if you don't tell me, you're driving me away. <sighs> not here. Ursäkta mig, kan vi få notan? We will pay, and I have somewhere to bring you. 
I swear I won't murder you. I must take this call. Please, finish your coffee, uh, and I'll pick up the check. No rush. Yes, thank you again for your time, Olda. After all this is over, I think I'll take some time for myself. Hulda? Yes. It was at this time that I made a call on my satellite phone to the phone I had provided for Graham Kasner. The cafe was relatively empty by this time, and the staff had given my mother and I significant privacy. While the car that had brought my mother had left the front of the cafe, a man dressed in a grey suit and holding a folded umbrella waited outside. When he had been approached by the waitstaff earlier in our conversation, he had not left. The following is a recording from my satellite phone on the short conversation held with Mr. Kasner. Any news? Not yet. Looking for updates. Have you made it out post Freestead? No, only any lesson. Have you encountered anything? Creatures and survivors. Can the survivors stay safe until they can be recovered? I believe so. So far, no one else has been able to make it in, so rescue is still impossible, I'm afraid. Once you clear up the disturbance at the site, the weather should calm down. I can assure you that the teams are prepared in Longyearbyen, and no one is permitted travel at this time. I know. Do you know anyone else here in the lesson? No. Why? Is someone else there with you? One of the survivors? Some things are just too coincidental to go unnoticed. Understood. I'll see what I can find out. But making contact again will become more difficult when you leave the town. I know. If possible, reach out to me on the radio there. Find a solution to this before I get to the outpost. Or I'll do it my way. I would expect no less. Good luck. The following is a continuation of the phone recording from my meeting with my mother in Stockholm. Thank you for waiting. They are closing up, but we don't have to rush. I'm done. What did Hilda have to say? No lies. No lies. There is a new problem presenting itself. You see, we have known there to be two parts that make up the structure of our work. Yes and no, family and not. We thought this was simple, and it has been this way for as long as any of us can remember, for all of our records and history. And inside this framework, we created the system that has worked for thousands of years. However, just now, Hulda has presented us with information that disagrees with this understanding. I'm not sure she even understands the severity of the information yet. There is someone, a woman, who is not of the family, but she is not targeted by the Firminther or our artifacts. Perhaps they don't see her as a threat like Hulda does. They don't seem interested in everyone to the same level. They tend to focus on individuals. Yes, they do. I see you have already picked up this much. But this is different. DNA tests show she is not family, but when directly confronted with Framinther artifacts and influencing factors, she does not suffer the kind of mental degradation or the ultimate outcome we have come to expect, death. Isn't that a good thing? The unknown? Never. Why? The balance is too important and too delicate to disrupt. (sighs) Hulda has a few more things she would like to try, but she will not tell me everything. Not yet. Who is she, this woman? No lies, but I still don't know as much as I would like. You know who Hulda is, but the other woman... She was part of a crew that encountered Firminther during a deep-sea migration to the Svalbard site. Some of her crew died, including one who became Firminther himself. 
but she suffered none of the known effects of such close proximity. She admitted, at least to representatives of Sidja, that she directly witnessed the transformation and still remained unaffected. Except, of course, in the typical fashion of one experiencing traumatic events. Her name is Dr. Amelia Murray. So it's all circumstantial? Omitting something without proof? How much did she really see? No. In addition, Hulda took some rather drastic steps. She ordered that an artifact be sent to Dr. Murray's apartment. It did not harm her. Eventually, it returned to Hulda without incident. Never in our history, on any continent, has an artifact failed. You tried to kill her? No, Hulda did. Hulda is her own family head. We are on friendly terms, but she is her own woman and controls her own sight. And she is willing to share her concerns with me. We should go. It's late. But the next train should be leaving in about two hours. And where do you hope we'll be going? North. You are, of course, free to leave. But I hope you choose to join me. Hulda may be responsible for the Svalbard site, but our family is responsible for one as well. If you join me there, I can explain everything I know. And maybe I won't lose another daughter. After consideration, I conceded to join my mother. We left the cafe as they closed up behind us, and the man in the grey suit walked with us to the end of the block. There we entered a car and started across Stockholm. My mother informed me that we would board a plane within the hour, but that we would not be leaving Sweden. The flight thereafter would take less than two hours. This concludes a third set of documents and recordings from the team's return to Svalbard and completes this section of information regarding the discovery of survivors in Nyarlasan and my progress regarding a family connection to the deadly events. The White Vault 